how you blessed us, oh God, to come into your presence, into this place once more. Nobody but you, God, that has brought us to this time. We are grateful for being alive, have our help, the strength that you've given us. Nobody but you, Lord, that has blessed and has provided for us, dear God. And we thank you, God, thank you, God. for being here on this special day yes, God. as we remember, oh God, the time of your resurrection. Thank you for coming into this world thank you, Lord. and dying for our sins. Lord, that we may have life. We appreciate it, God. Yes, God. We are saying thank you. We thank you. praise your name now. In the name of Jesus. Let this be a good day. Let it be a blessed day. Let it be a productive day. God, I pray that the word will be taught in the Sunday school time. Your word will come later in the service. Move by your spirit. Let somebody be delivered today. Let somebody be saved, oh God. Let them be healed and delivered, oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, we seek you, God, your will, your way. Lead and direct our path. And oh, God, we're going to give you the praises and the glory that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Understand that we couldn't be numbered among the dead, but God has blessed us to be numbered among the living on this great resurrection Sunday. Thank God that He arose. And you know, uh, it, it may seem to some people too familiar to study the same lessons around the same time every year, but I think that it's so important that we remember. It seems that too many of us have forgotten the sacrifice that He made. So we need to be reminded, not just on uh, Resurrection Day, uh, not just during Resurrection season, but from time to time, we need to um, revisit the story. We need to revisit so that we can remember the sacrifice that was made for us and uh, the um, blessings of the resurrection, the sacrifice that was made for us during his death and the blessings that we get from his resurrection. So we want to take another look at the resurrection today. Um, and that's what our subject is, the resurrection of Jesus. And I, if you do not have a book today, we're coming from Luke 24, 1 through 12, and 30 through 35. Again, that's Luke 24, 1 through 12, and 30 through 35. Our lesson aim for today, facts to understand the reality of the post-resurrection events recorded in scripture. The principle to understand that the resurrection of Christ is crucial to the transformation of people. So we need to understand that Christ's resurrection is crucial, it is important, it is necessary in order to transform people, in order to change people in order to experience the, the change uh, or the miracle of salvation, his resurrection is necessary, all right? And then the application to give assurance that Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead and to make this truth central, the centerpiece of our message to unbelievers. There are still people who doubt, who do not believe in the resurrection. Uh, and so it, it, is, it behooves us to um, revisit the story. We have to revisit the story because the dying world needs to know that Jesus is alive and well. All right. So let's look at our introduction. Do you have the introduction, Sister um, Sister Minnie, if you can read the introduction loud enough for everybody to hear you. Okay. Introduction. In an article published over 30 years ago in Christianity Today, let the pagans have the holiday, 
December 13, 1993. Rodney Clapp outlined and laminated the commercialization of Christmas, which was only celebrated since that time. His purpose, however, was not simply to laminate the commercialization of Christmas. Rather, he aimed to show that Easter is really our most important holiday, our better celebrate, celebration. We rejoice in the incarnation of our Savior, which we celebrate at Christmas. But without the resurrection, which we celebrate at Easter, we have no Savior. We are yet in our sins. In this lesson, we will focus on the resurrection of Christ and the glory and honor he deserves because of it. While we still want to maintain a proper spiritual focus at Christmas, we need to give even greater attention to Easter. We cannot concede this holiday to commercialization. All right. So, yes. Yes, uh, we know that now the world calls it Easter, and I see that our, the, um, the book that we're using calls it Easter, but we know that Easter is the pagan holiday. We celebrate the resurrection. I was reading where one person said, you know, they always debating about whether we should celebrate quote unquote Easter. And so no, we don't celebrate Easter. Easter is a pagan holiday. Right. But what we do celebrate is the fact that Jesus rose he died and he rose again. That is our celebration. So Christians, we know that it is the resurrection that we celebrate. And so, uh, yes, it has been commercialized. Um, the Easter bunny, they talk about the Easter bunny. They make sure that they have the baskets. They make sure that many of us, oh, uh, many people, I, I say us, but I, I don't have to have new clothes. I don't buy new clothes for Easter, but if you do, that's fine. If you want to celebrate the resurrection in brand new clothes, that's fine. As long as you know the true meaning of this celebration. And it is not the bunny, it's not the eggs, it's not the Easter baskets, it is not the brand new clothes. It is the fact that Jesus rose. He rose, he died, and he rose again for our salvation. For our salvation so that we could go to heaven one day so we don't have to know the truth of the message that's why every child should be in church today Amen. every child should be in church because listen we yeah, yeah let me tell y'all something as americans we are raising a generation without god we are trying to raise a generation and we are trying to do it without the savior and so I, I told my husband, my husband and I were talking about the fact that um, we were talking about the, the superheroes. And so our children are more familiar with Superman than they are with Jesus. And there's no comparison. Superman is fictional. Batman is fictional. But we have a savior. We have a savior, a risen savior. And when we think about all the other religions... How that they 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 look for Buddha and they look for Confucius and they look to uh, Allah and Mohammed. No, none of them have the testimony of rising again. None of them have the the, the historical proof that the grave was empty, except Jesus. So Jesus cannot be compared. He cannot really be compared to Mohammed. He can't be compared to Confucius. He can't be compared to any of them. Because there is no comparison. There's no comparison. And we need to remind our children, we need to listen. So many people have quit church post-pandemic. Some of them quit it before then. But I'm telling y'all who are paying, who's paying the price here. The children are paying the price. If you mess up, I saw where a parent say she went to her son's school. And that she, um. She said, I, I, I stood back and watched, and she said, what I saw was uh, heartbreaking, just looking at what was going on in her child's school. And she said it was just heartbreaking to see the, what, what the children had going on. Yes. All right. What her children had, what the children that she saw had going on. So we're trying to raise these children without God. And as a result of raising them without God, 
our children are doing every ungodly thing under the sun now. They're doing every ungodly thing under the sun. So what we need to do, listen, this is a call to bring our children back to church. This is a call to get our children, our grandchildren, back to church. If you have children who are not getting these children to church, get your grandchildren to church because I'm going to tell you something. Our children and our grandchildren lay on our hearts, don't they? Amen. And if we don't get Jesus in them, it's going to cause us many heartache, hardships, prayers later on. Yes, so we got to do everything we got to do to get them to church. And sometimes, you know, you can keep your kids about, you know, about coming to church after the love of God. Yes, ma'am. when they get a certain age, they start falling away. And they know how they were brought up. And do you think it's wrong for, for a person to tell their child, you know, when they get grown and, and they, they that, that uh, drop from the church? Do you think it's wrong for a, a parent to, to go to, you know, to tell y'all go they grow? Because you know, I don't know what you to tell them this thing. But do you think it's wrong for a it is absolutely not wrong for you to tell them because again when our children are grown we we what would i look like ministering to everybody else but my children mm -hmm. i'm going to minister to them if you have children who are not saved you need to remind them and yes sometimes they don't want to hear mom but we have to keep telling them we have to keep reminding them because our hearts are broken if we have a child who, who dies and don't know Jesus, don't know the Savior. So we never finish praying for them. We never finish ministering to them. Whether they are saved or not, we don't finish ministering to them because we still have to tell them, you know, we still have to uh, nurture them in their faith if, when they are saved. Yes, ma'am. But uh, I'm not calling a name, but I talked to a, a lady that uh, this is her granddaughter, mm -hmm. and, which is my great granddaughter. And I was telling her to call her granddaughter to tell her about, about coming to church. I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna call, call that woman. She grown, and and and, and, and uh, if she wanna make up in her mind to come to, to go to church. Uh, it's up to her. What, what don't you think? Since that's her granddaughter, that she should tell her. And she and her granddaughter was brought up in the church. And when she started getting her age, she started falling her, falling away. Well, I'm gonna say this, Mother Laws. I'm gonna tell my children, my grandchildren, my great grand, any of them that I live to to uh to to me. I'm going to keep them before the Lord. I'm going to keep them before the Lord. And that includes telling them when they need to be told something, whether they like it or not. Now, I do agree. I do say this, that timing, you know, the way we present the gospel and the time that we present the gospel are very crucial. I don't think that we just always beat them over the head with it. But I think that just like we ask God, Lord, open up opportunities for me on my job, open up opportunities for me in my day, day interactions with people so that I can share the message with them, then we have to do the same thing with people in our families. But we never give up on them. We never say, oh, you know, well, hey, they're grown now because grown folk need Jesus. Some of us didn't come to Jesus until we got grown. And somebody invited us to church. Somebody reminded us. That we needed to be, you know, to be saved. Somebody reminded us we needed to come back to God. And so, yes, that would be my answer to that. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's look at visiting the tomb. Visiting the tomb, Luke 24, 1 through 11. All right, visiting the tomb. I'm sorry, the women visiting the tomb. I don't know how I just cut the hair for. All right, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. 
And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much complexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he but is risen. Remember how he spake to you unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven and to the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them, which told them these things unto the apostles, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales. And they believed them not. All right, let's have some comments on this portion of the scripture. This is a very familiar story. Let's, let's have some comments on the women visiting the tomb. Why were they there? What were they doing? How, how did the, who rolled the stone away? Talk to me about some of those questions. Night Jones, I can only imagine the trauma that they suffered watching Jesus go through it. Even the very depiction that Pastor showed last week, you know, to see the women, because the women were right there now. They were there. They witnessed the crucifixion. They seemed to me to be some of the most devout followers of Christ because they were right there when he was crucified, even though others went their own way. You know, Peter, when they confronted Peter, Peter said, uh, I don't know him. Say, Peter, he started cussing. Say, I don't know him. And, and, and so, but I see the women right there watching this gruesome uh, scene unfold. How they whipped him with 39 lashes because they were told they, they knew that 40 lashes would kill him. So they did, they whipped him 39 times and pastor so vividly described that the ends of the, the, uh, the whips had bones in, fragments of bones so that when they would, when, when it grabbed his skin and they would pull that whip, it would tear his skin. He was, it was a bloody death. It was a bloody death. And you see these women are right there watching the entire thing. So I can only imagine, you know, that in their trauma, they may not have thought about 
what Jesus said. They, they didn't have the resolve to remember that Jesus said that this was going to happen. And I think one account says that it was hidden from them. Say it was like it was hidden from them so that they, they, they really couldn't comprehend it. And I also thought about, you know, sometimes when we have loved ones who, are, who seem to be on their dying bed or they're, they're, they're lingering in death or they just get sick and they try to prepare us for it. So they begin to talk to us and they say, you know what, this is, you, my, my burial uh, insurance is here. My, my, they begin to prepare you for what, what? What do some of us say? Don't talk like that. And that's exactly what they told Jesus. When Jesus tried to prepare Peter, what did Peter do? Peter rebuked him. Peter did just like some of us when we're try, people try to prepare us for, for, our, for their death. Peter said, oh, no, Lord, ain't none of this been to happen. You know, Peter cut Malchus' ear off. Peter was a fighter, and he probably thought he was a good one. Because he said, uh-uh, we ain't finna have none of this. Ain't nobody finna put their hands on you. You know, the disciples even talked about calling down fire from heaven. Lord, should we call out fire from heaven <laughs> on these folk? So they were still in the flesh. Can you get that for me, Sister Night and Jones? They were still in the flesh. And so Jesus had tried to prepare them for his death. He had told them that I'm going to be get handed over. You know, they had seen the triumphant Jesus. They loved the Jesus who fed the 5,000 with the, with the fish and the, and the loaves of bread. They loved the Jesus who could walk on water. They loved the Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead. But it was the suffering Savior that they could not, that they couldn't handle. They couldn't handle him in his suffering. They couldn't handle him. And what they probably perceived was his weakness, but was his what? Greatest strength. Because he did not, they didn't take his life. He, he laid it down. He gave it up for you and me. And so I can only imagine what they must have been thinking. And so here, these devout women, these devoted women who have followed him all the way through the crucifixion, they want to do what they have been trained to do, what they have, have always done. They want to prepare the body with spices. And they lingered because the Sabbath had come. And so Sister Nadia Jones says, some commentators talked about the fact that uh, he was actually crucified on a Thursday because they called that the Jewish uh, time, I believe I read some time ago, that at a certain time they considered that, uh, I, I think I looked somewhere, they talked about high Sabbath. They just, they just, you know, told how all of those things came to pass. But nevertheless, we know he was crucified. He was crucified and he was buried. So here come the women and they are bringing the spices to anoint the body. But when they got there, they were wondering who was going to roll the stone away. So who rolled the stone away? Huh? Yeah. All right, the angels. One account says that um, the angels, when they moved the stone away, there was an earthquake. Now, they didn't move the stone away so that Jesus could get out. Because Jesus wasn't, he wasn't a prisoner now. Right. Jesus was already out, but they moved the stone away so that the others could get in. Mm -hmm. So when the, oh, I'm sorry, Brother Archie, I think I saw your hand earlier. Uh, I mean, we described it. Or we could, I'm saying, um, you know, the Ellison. Okay. Okay, I'm so with, no, all right, thank you. So, um, yes, yeah, so the women go in, Mary Magdalene and all of them, and the angels talk to them, and they tell them, don't you remember when Jesus told you that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rising, and immediately... I can imagine also, Sister Minnie, that Jesus taught them intimately for three years. He told them a whole lot of things. And, and, and so, you know, for them to, to, to uh, you know, they just didn't remember that. That he said that, you know, the third day I'm going to rise again. 
so that they could be, you know, sitting on pins and needles and, and hoping, you know, and waiting, going to the tomb to, to um, verify his resurrection. They were doing none of that. They didn't even remember that he told them that he was going to rise again. So it's like when the, when the angels reminded them, they were like, oh, yes, he sure did tell us that. On more than one occasion. Absolutely. On more than one occasion. But they were too busy trying to, uh, you know, not wanting to look forward to his death. Not wanting to look forward to his, his, his suffering. Not with, and, and if I can't get to his death, if I can't get past his death, if I can't get past his suffering, I, I ain't looking for the resurrection. I can't even get past the death. Right. All right, Sister Joan. Uh, I think you brought out a marvelous point about that was a mother looking at her child. Also on the cross. All right. And a relative of being, and I, I just couldn't imagine her as a mother seeing her child go through that and carrying the cross and every step of the way. So uh, the human side of Christ was brought out. Absolutely. And, as well as the divine side. Then, and when we go through these things, uh, losing someone we love, we do have a tendency to forget. Um, I marvel at some people that have lost two or three children. Like, how could you do that? But they're in the Word of God. I don't, I don't know what could have helped me if Jesus, if I was married and I saw my child lose a skin and a spit on him and, yes. and, and crown his head with thorns and, and pierce him in his side and I couldn't imagine what she went through. Exactly. You know, so, I, you know, I, I, that was something, but for them to be energized when the angels gave a message, and then they went and gave that message to the to the disciples. Yes. That, that's a hard thing. I can't, I might be the only somebody that haven't seen the passion of Christ. It's, I just so far I can go with it. You know, but I have not seen it because of knowing what is going to take place and listening to so many people talk about it. You know, I looked at the um, the fact that I, I I know that it had to be um, God leading Mel Gibson to uh, put on that um, passion of the passion of Christ. It was one of the most uh, lucrative. It was it grossed more money than any religious film ever. And I looked at I read something that was talking about all of the things that happened while they were filming. They talked about what happened to the actor and how uh, an atheist who played one of the parts gave his life to God. Glory. Just playing the part. Hallelujah. He was an atheist and he gave his, his life to Christ. They talked about several things that happened just from on the production of, of the Passion of the Christ. So, I, you know, just, yes, Sister Jones, it's, it's, it's hard to watch, it's hard to see, but from time to time, I want, I want to go back and I want to look because I want to remember. I want to remember, you know, I look at Isaiah, I, I love to read what Isaiah says in chapter 53. He talks about there was no beauty to behold him. So yes, the, the crucifixion wasn't, it was an ugly ordeal. It was the worst death that a man could die. And, but Jesus did all of this just so you and I could be saved, so that you and I could live with him forever. And I thought about also, I think one of you talked about the fact that Jesus told him on multiple occasions what was going to happen. And, 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 but you know, I think about that. He tried to tell them what would happen, but how could you be prepared for such a bloody sight? How could you truly be prepared? I look at Luke chapter 18, verse 34. It talked about this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. So it's like, I, I believe, this is just my personal belief, just just like that, that, that saying was hid from him, I think that sometimes... God allows certain revelations to be unfolded for us 
understanding that at certain points and times in our lives, we can't handle certain things. You know, we, we think about, and that's the beauty of the, the um, that's the beauty of, of sanctification. How God doesn't let us get it all at one time. You can be a student of the Bible for 50, so they tell me that date, a finished date with that date's Bible took 50 years of research to put that, that Bible together. You can be a student of the Bible for 50 years, for 80 years, and still see freshness. Because the Bible says that that word is alive and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So, so I, I said that to say this, you know, God in his wisdom, you know, he hid certain things from them. And this was some of the things that he hid from them. And they, they really couldn't comprehend it. They really didn't know it. They really, they really couldn't fully appreciate what Jesus had to go through. And I think that, that probably another reason is because they were living in, in the now, as many of us are. We're living in the now, and, you know, we cannot grasp what's going to happen in the future because we're too busy living in the now. And so the women, you know, they were not the only ones who forgot. The disciples also forgot because, you, as I told y'all earlier, Peter rebuked Jesus and said, this shall not be unto thee. I will not have it. <laughs> if I got to fight to protect you, nobody going to put their hands on you, Jesus. And, and Jesus began to let him know, you know, that this is, you know, this spirit that, that's dealing with you right now is not of God. Because this has to happen. This has to, to be done. All right? So, um, any more comments before we go to the next outline? Any more comments? I would like to say that this was so emotional that I can see that I can see how Peter reacted. Yes. When when um Jesus was telling them those things because they um we're human and we don't be wanting to hear stuff like that. that Absolutely. Hurt us or especially someone that we love and. He was telling them what was going to happen to him and how he was going to be betrayed and how the um, people, the Sanhedrin Council and the Pharisees, and he said that I must do this in order for us to uh, to live. And it was so it was so traumatic until I was watching um, the movie of the other night, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, and it got to some points that I just had to turn it to another. And then turn it back when that scene was gone because mm -hmm. it was so emotional. Yes. And it was very emotional. And it was such upheaval going on at this time, especially with the uh, Pharisees and the Sanhedrin Council. Mm -hmm. They were saying that he was coming against the law and he was teaching things that were unlawful. And he was there only helping the blind to see the lame to walk the dog. Yes. Raising that from the dead. I said, Lord, I thank you. I said, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you. I thank you. For willingly giving up yourself for me. Absolutely. And that's something to think about. All right. Someone else? You know, Sister Ryle, well, I just was thinking about, um, you know, I've heard everything. I enjoyed it. thought about Sister Jones was saying about the motherly love. And look at this. You see these women going forth first because of me. Isn't it like that today? The women in the church, the women deaconess, the women with the prayer. It's just like that today. <laughs> and we we are emotional. God has created us to be emotional beings. The women, we are more emotional beings. So I can imagine Mary going there and and discovering her son is not. You know, I'm in a predicament right now. I'm in a predicament right now. And my son is not here. We in two different states. But I got this emotional, this, this on the inside. Absolutely. And I trust God. So it's something about that motherly love that we have. And when they went back to tell the disciples, they didn't believe it. The, the woman, the I have to say that's out of tell. These women have gone mad. <laughs> something wrong with you. You know, they, that's what they're thinking. But it's something about their mother love. So you believe one of these other women was Mary, the mother of Jesus. 
because we talk about Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and the other women that were with him. You think Mary, Mary, uh, his mother was one of those other women? I think it was. Okay. I really do believe that. All right. Maybe. It doesn't really say here, but you know. Maybe it could very well have been. If I'm looking at everybody, all the mothers up in here, if something done happened to one of their children, they don't. <laughs> I, don't I don't know why. It, but it's a I mean, that's just, but we can't add to it. I mean, we're not, yeah. but I'm just looking at it. I know they don't. They, they, but is it mentioned in other gospels? Now, now, we, now, now do those, it just says other ones. I wonder why it was that. That's just me. I don't know. I thought about that. Yeah, I mean, that's just your inference. Mm -hmm. All right? Did you have something to pass? All right, second outline. Peter investigating the tomb. It would be Peter, wouldn't it? Yeah. Verse 12. Luke 24, verse 12. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself. And that which was come to pass. All right, talk, talk to me about what Peter got going on here. How is it that he comes to investigate? <laughs> because they, of course, they don't have all the scriptures here, so you can fill in some of the blanks in your comments. You know, it, it, it's so glad to me. Yes, if you, if you, when you analyze his character, Peter is the one, and you, you, you called it right. He, he's emotional, and he, um, he cuts off Malchus's ear. You know, trying to quote unquote save Jesus. Then uh, he, he denies Jesus, and then so now we find him back fishing. Now, keep in mind, he's been traveling with Jesus for three years, but he has, he has denied. He has fought. He's, he's gone back to his old way of living. Isn't it great that Jesus did not throw him away? Amen. He's, the women go right back to Peter, find Peter, to let him know what has happened. And what does Peter do? Yes. I got a question. Did Peter go to the tomb because he believed Christ had risen from the grave? I, I think I think he thought about what Christ had prophesied about that he was going to deny him three times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
three three times before the crop cup uh the cup the cup yeah, crow. and and uh uh he wanted to find out you know was it true i i do believe he wanted to see if that was it or he might have been in his protective mode i mean he, he really reminds me of Right, because we just read that they that these words sound to them like idle tales. So we have nothing that says to us that Peter went because he believed or that he went because he didn't. All we know is is Peter showed up. Well, can you think that what what is skeptical? Could Peter have been skeptical? S slow to believe. Absolutely. I don't think he went there just because he believed. He went there, like y'all say, to see. Let me go see what's going on. For Peter to show up, would he even take little faith? Would it be something that had some type Either faith or curiosity. That's why I say skeptical. Peter. One or the other, or both. Peter, at this time, nor John, actually believed. Not at this point. Because now, it's, it, you have to take all four Gospels to kind of see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And some things are not written in chronological order. Because let's look at what happened when the women went to the tomb and they would go, uh, you know, they were asking who shall roll the stone away. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're going to see the angels and the angels declare he is not here. He is not here. Now, you remember the question that, that when, when the women, they want, when they went and looked, and I think this occurred before the angel said he's not here, and they discovered the body was gone. Remember, they, they, they asked the question, where have they taken my Lord's body? They thought initially somebody had stolen the body of Jesus, mm -hmm. right. which would have been very disrespectful. All right? And they asked the gardener, who they thought was the gardener, tell us where you take his body because they wanted to go and do the proper burial. All right. And of course, the angel said, he is not here. Uh, he is risen. Now, and, and if I'm not mistaken, the angel said, go and tell the disciples. At that moment, they had not seen the risen Lord. And I'm not so sure if those women believed all together at that time, 100%, because they had not seen the Lord then. They go and tell Peter and, and the disciples. Peter and John take off running. Of course, the Bible says John got there first because he was young. He waited for Peter to come in. Peter looked in. Now, when they go back, they don't really believe at this particular time. Peter and, Jane, and, Peter and John, rather, I think they went more out of curiosity. And I think that at this particular time, they really were thinking that somebody would come here <laughs> and have stolen his body. They didn't really just believe at this, this moment, even though Jesus had told them more than once, on the third day, I'm going to rise. But now you got to remember something. This has never happened before. This is even beyond what Lazarus had gone through. You know, you know God raised Lazarus, but Jesus raised him after being dead four days. But the one who raised Lazarus from the dead, he's gone. And, 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 and in their minds, they got to think, probably no doubt were thinking about how bad they did Jesus. I, I heard y'all talking about the women were there. I think at the crucifixion, I think that's what you all talking about. They were there at the crucifixion. But uh, we know John was there too. Y'all remember John being there? Uh, okay, John was there. I think Peter may have been there as well, but I know John was there. And of course, was where? John was at the crucifixion. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so if he was the only one who was present, I'm sure he would have given the language. He would have Walk given, there up. given the language that what? About how bad they had done the Lord Jesus. And so the, the, the idea of can Jesus come back after, remember his, his face was disfigured, his body was beaten. Uh, 
he probably, the blood had probably completely drained out of the cross. Because remember, after all the blood came out, water came out. Yeah. How in the world could this man be alive? I don't believe they thought he was alive at that time. Now, what happens? After Peter and James, I mean, I keep saying James, but after Peter and John go back to where the other disciples were, then those women will go back to the tomb. All right? And, of course, the Lord appeared to one of them, to one first, Mary, I mean, Mary Magdalene. And, and, and uh, she didn't understand or know who he was until he spoke. And she turned around and she figured out, this is, the, this is Jesus. And somewhere after that, the other two, two, of the, uh, two more of the women, saw it. The Lord alive. And he tells them to what? To go and tell. To, to, matter of fact, this time to uh, tell them I'm going to meet them in Galilee. And so forth. I don't think the disciples really fully grasped this thing until Jesus appeared to them when they were all together except for Thomas. And you know, Thomas was not there. Thomas um, said, I'm not going to believe you. Believe what y'all saying? Until I can put my hand, my fingers in the place where those nails were. So uh, we talk about doubtful Thomas, but actually all the guys really didn't really accept or believe until they saw him. Y'all follow what I'm saying? So I think they, I think that they went initially because they thought somebody had taken his body. That was a very disrespectful thing. Do you think they believe something did happen because of the cross? That the scripture talks about the cross. Uh, that's a good question. If they did, it was very, very little. But I, I don't think they really believe. I think at this time that we we look at after the fact. But they were under all this pressure, all this stress. And yes, Peter had to be thinking about how to die. You know, uh, because that's why the Lord even told, the, told those women, say, uh, go tell my disciples. And one of the gospels say, that his name Peter, say, tell me. <laughs> tell Peter. Because he knew Peter was in trouble. <laughs> because of what he had done. All right. And, but. If they had gone, and I'm just saying, I believe the stress and the excitement, I don't know if they connected all the dots, but it would have been something if they could have seen the fact that when they went to that tomb, as you pointed out, those clothing, the grave clothing and the napkin that was on his face, it seemed like it was even folded neatly, would, would have shown. Nobody could have uh, come in here and ramshacked the grave to steal his body because they wouldn't have taken the time to and put those clothes in a neat and orderly manner. Amen. So that, uh, that verse 25 kind of uh, says that I'll took a look at um, uh, verse 25, he used to call him a fool. <laughs> you don't believe me. It says, then he said unto them, O fools, mm -hmm. and slow of heart to believe. believe all that the prophets had spoken. So he's been talking all the way back right. in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, we still don't believe. I like um, also, Sister Jones, I like if you look at how Jesus reveals himself to different facets, facets of people at different times. So, you know, you can't just say the disciples came and stole his body away. He appears to women. He appears to the disciples. He appears to these ordinary men on the road of Emmaus. And he begins to talk to them. And, and uh, as he begins to talk to them, and they, they say, uh, well, now, where, who are you? Where, are you? where have you been? And you, you don't know what, is, what has happened around here <laughs> in, over the last few days? Where have you been? And so as, as Jesus will continue talking to them, then uh, their eyes are opened and they see that this is none other than Jesus who has been talking to them. So it's like he, he, he reveals himself. He, he, the evidence is overwhelming, if you allow me to say. As he begins to reveal himself, many of them saw him with their own eyes. 
We talk about in one account that the men, the uh, the men, the gen, the men who were out there keeping the um, keeping the um, guard, the tomb. yeah, the guard, the tomb, the guards, the guards who were guarding the tomb. You know, even they uh, saw what happened. So different people saw exactly, you know, the fact that hey, Jesus is is really alive and he's really he is risen just like he said. And uh, it was a miracle, like you said, for his clothes to be um, neatly folded. There is nothing that shows anything. You know, he didn't tear out of his clothes. He did. You know, he they're just neatly fold, folded there, and the thing that was on his face is just neatly laid there. So there, is, evidence is is overwhelming that uh, Jesus uh, he um, rose just like he said. Now we've been talking about the fact that Jesus warned them. But it had been prophesied. Yeah. And, you know, it had been prophesied by many. And that, that's the thing about the Pharisees and the, and the scribes who were supposed to be these religious leaders and who were supposed to, you know, who prided themselves in knowing the law and knowing all of these things, knowing the prophets. But how can you miss Jesus? And when you have, you know, you're supposed to be these doctors of the law. You're supposed to be these people who, who knew exactly what was going on. Can I when, say something? Yes, come on. Now, the Pharisees, scribes, uh, they, will, they were well-versed in the scripture. Even you go back to the birth of Christ, when the wise men would approach Herod, and, and, and the Bible said all Jerusalem was troubled. What did Herod do? He called for the scribes to come. And the scribes came and told them what Michael 5 and 2 stated, how that he would be born in Bethlehem. Yes. Now, that, that indicates yes, they were well versed in the scriptures, but they did not accept the word of the Lord. Wow. There are some studies that indicate that the Pharisees were demonic, uh, that they were working with demonic powers, mm -hmm. actually, and they probably were uh, doing so. Now, that, that's, that's not to say all Pharisees, because a few of them did accept Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. He accepted the Lord. And there were some others that the Bible seems to indicate. But as a whole, they would not accept Jesus. And that thought just came to me just a moment ago about even in today's time, we have preachers preaching in the pulpit who know the word of God, know what it says about salvation, about holiness, but yet they decide to live a life of sin and doing their own thing because of uh, various reasons. That's how those Pharisees were. They knew. They had the word of God. But they rejected God. And listen, when you keep rejecting the word of the Lord over and over and over again, your heart becomes hardened. And you can keep rejecting God so long until the Lord said, that's it. I've given them enough opportunity to get it right. And he can withdraw the Holy Spirit from giving you that conviction or giving you that warning and just let you go on your own way because you decide you want to reject. That's what, what really happened to many Pharisees because y'all remember the one saying Jesus said you could not be forgiven. What, what's that one saying? Blaspheming. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And and that if you look at that passage very carefully, that's what Jesus really was saying that many of these Pharisees had done that they have blasphemed the Holy Ghost because, and that indicates the fact that they understood that what Jesus was doing was of God and that the Spirit of God was actually working through him. Mm -hmm. You see, you cannot blaspheme the Holy Ghost and be ignorant of his Spirit. You can't do it, all right? You know, in order to blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you gotta have some knowledge. They had knowledge. Mm -hmm. They had knowledge, but they kept rejecting and rejecting. And, and went to the point where they went too far and even blasphemed the Holy Ghost. All right, it is time for us to come to an end, bring our Sunday school to an end. We thank God for all of you who are here on this morning. It is now time to share your Sunday school offering. Those of you who are in the sanctuary, Sister Knight and Jones will receive your Sunday school offering. Those of you who have joined us by way of, um, don't stop yet, by way of um, Zoom and Facebook, we, ask, we invite you to share your offering at Givelify, look for Lily of the Valley, Church of God in Christ, at um, 
in Greenville, Mississippi, where Roy Riley Jr. is the pastor, or you can share through Cash App at dollar sign L O T V C O G I C. That's L O T V C O G I C. Listen, you still have time to come and be with us as we celebrate the resurrection at 1030. We will begin at 1030. Go ahead, get dressed, come on down. You don't even have to have a new uh, outfit to be here today. We don't, many of us, most of us don't have on a new outfit. We just come here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you got a new outfit, we don't mind you wearing it. You come on down in your uh, colors, whatever you got, just come as you are. God bless you. We'll see you at 1030. We love you with the love of God.